Thousands of eyewitnesses claim to have seen alien visitors. But do we really know what they look like? Has the U.S. government actually studied the bodies of alien beings? What could aliens from another world hope to gain from visiting ours? Join us as we attempt to discover the true nature of alien visitors to our world in this chapter of UFO Diaries. of all of our UFO diaries is one persistent question. If intelligent life forms are visiting our world, what are they like? Are they our friends or our enemies? Apparently, more people than ever now believe that humankind is being visited by extraterrestrials. Their opinions have been molded by what appears to be an overwhelming body of evidence, from reliable eyewitness sightings of UFOs to strange marks left at landing sites to stories of face-to-face -face contact with beings from another world. But if these beings do exist and are visiting us, what do we really know about them? If they truly are interacting with humans, isn't it imperative we learn what their true mission is? UFO researchers have been searching for that answer since 1947, when a private pilot named Kenneth Arnold saw an amazing group of aircraft. His description of what he saw sparked the widespread use of the term flying saucer. Since that time, hundreds of thousands of people have reported similar sightings and have wondered what sort of beings could design, build, and operate such craft. And why have they come here? Then, in the summer of that same year, an incident occurred that many people now claim should have provided a final answer to the mystery of the flying saucers. We know that some sort of extraterrestrial object crashed in New Mexico in July of 1947. But according to the first-hand witnesses, there was no vehicle made on Earth. Apparently the bodies and the metallic debris were impounded by the military. If all of this is true, and the evidence strongly suggests that it is, then our government, for some reason, has taken the stance that the general public must not be told the truth. But why? Why would our government wish to conceal the fact that alien beings have come to our world? And do we know for certain that they have concealed such evidence? All you need to do is pick up a couple of well-documented books who have done the work we should be doing, which is going through the Freedom of Information Acts and requesting the, the covert or the secret um, information that has been kept from us that will verify for anyone who doubts our government's involvement in their own words and their own documents. But if the real nature of alien visitors is being hidden, who are the guardians of this secret? They, some groups call it the wise men, the magi, magic 12, MJ 12, was an organization that was apparently appointed as early as 1947, 49 to deal with this issue, to study it, to establish some policy and make some policy on how, how are we going to respond? How are we going to deal with the reality of extraterrestrial alien involvement? Now an organization very much like that still exists, but they don't call it MJ-12 anymore. It uh, is literally a multinational, multi-agency, international organization trying to keep the lid on this thing to keep the cover on it to control the release of the information in my opinion there's a lot of reasons 
why the government and NASA would want to cover up this situation, but I think there's one main reason that seems to wash mostly for me. In, in, in my mind, uh, it starts with the Brookings Institution report in 1961. NASA contracted the think tank in Washington to kind of project what would happen if our planet was to find an extraterrestrial artifact or even extraterrestrials themselves. The Brookings report concluded that one consequence of our exploration of space might be a face-to-face -face confrontation with extraterrestrial intelligence. They advised Congress that such an encounter would inevitably throw the world into chaos. Any more advanced society that comes and meets one of lower level is automatic, the lower level society is automatically absorbed by the technologically advanced one. Culminating in the collapse of religion and government throughout the world. And this is something I believe that the leaders of our institutions simply wouldn't want to face. They put a great deal of effort into concealing what they do know about the extraterrestrials. Well, I found yesterday in my field was a weather balloon. Oh, was a lie in the cover-up has literally threatened our constitutional process. And that's why I'm involved, why I'm speaking out why I'm violating my national security oath by doing so. Can this really be true? If there is some terrible secret concerning the true nature of alien visitors, what can it possibly be? Is it simply that intelligent life is not limited to the planet Earth? I think that there might be a way to gently let people in on the, what I consider a very acceptable fact, that they we're not alone in the universe. Because eventually it's going to affect the lives of every man, woman, and child on the planet. And it's crucial that people start to pay attention. It's crucial that the government starts to tell us the truth. But according to UFO experts, the alleged attempts to conceal the truth about alien visitors has not been entirely successful. Hundreds of people have reported sightings of UFOs and contact with aliens. And from their stories, we may be able to piece together the secret that MJ-12 is said to be hiding. We can theorize that UFOs are made of substances not found on Earth. We know from our study of outer space that vessels traveling interstellar distances would be subjected to all sorts of stresses and unrelenting radiation. For example, there are many witnesses who have described the debris found in New Mexico in July of 1947. Despite being thin and fragile seeming, it has defied all attempts to cut it, burn it, puncture it, or damage it in any way. If this is true, then there is still nothing made on our planet that has such remarkable properties. But then, according to many witnesses, UFOs have always exhibited powers far beyond our current level of technology. We've concluded that some of the intelligences that we are interrelating with apparently are multidimensional. That really upsets a lot of people. I find it exciting, but it bothers a lot of people. They walk right through the wall. The implication of Earth being invaded by multidimensional beings is frightening. If we assume their intentions are to do harm. The ability to somehow move effortlessly through what we regard as solid objects is one of the characteristics of alien beings that makes modern scientists shudder. But does the concept of multidimensional beings have any validity? Is such a thing possible? That concept in itself turns our idea of physics, the old Newtonian Einstein idea of physics, totally upside down. So if UFOs are made by beings who are masters of such advanced technology, what could they gain from visiting our relatively primitive world? And for that matter, do the countless reports of UFO sightings all describe the same vehicles, the same visitors to our world? How reliable are these reports? Can they be checked and cross-checked? Have the witnesses really seen an alien? If so, do these creatures come from one planet with one mission? Or are there countless varieties and species, each with a different purpose? The startling answers when UFO Diaries return. A growing number of UFO researchers claim that the United States government has for a half century had undeniable proof of extraterrestrial intelligence and had hidden that evidence from the general public. 
But is it not just as likely that reports of encounters with alien beings are really nothing more than dreams, hallucinations, and imaginations run wild? I don't think you can argue with the thousands of reports, visual reports, sightings by credible people that have happened over the decades. I and other researchers, we get these drawings and we look and we compare. And somebody in California has drawn something that looks like what somebody drew in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. These people have never seen each other. They don't know anything about each other's lives. And when you, when you start and lay out all of these drawings and you say, what are the patterns that people have been reporting for decades? they break down into this category of what is known as the grays. Sort of like we talk about Kleenex and Xerox now. There is this gray. And yet, many of the most reliable witnesses have reported seeing aliens of widely differing types. There's a, a, a number of aliens visiting here. It's not just a simple they. It's a very complex they, and they seem to be coming from everywhere on every kind of business doing everything. From personal knowledge, I can talk about two different kind. From research with other people who've had the experiences, I know there are more different physical reported types. People will describe uh, creatures that look like a kind of a blend, half human, half alien. There's another group that appears to have something like a reptilian quality. The pupils of their eyes are vertical. I have personally seen the insectoid or praying mantis type creatures. And then there's another group that uh, about eight feet tall, very pale, no hair at all, that are basically humanoid, but they're massive people. We may be dealing with over a dozen separate groups, maybe even more. We really don't know. The variety of aliens that have been described over the years may suggest that Earth is being visited by representatives of many different worlds. The problem is that it may also prove that the witnesses are simply not telling the truth. Would it not be more convincing evidence if everyone who claimed to have seen an alien being described the same features? There are some variations, but about, I'd say, 85% of the descriptions fall in a particular range. Uh, the vast majority of reports uh, are of small beings, gray, uh, uh, maybe four feet tall, a little bit higher, a little bit taller, a little bit smaller sometimes. If enough witnesses describe the same kind of alien, we could build up a detailed description of the alien race that seems to be most frequently visiting our world. Well, they have very large heads. Uh, no hair, no nose to speak of, no ears, a little slit for mouth, very thin uh, pointed chin, thin body, thin arms, thin legs. They have a tiny little thin neck, and many people are amazed that this little neck will hold this big head upright. Very large black wraparound eyes, or just huge black almond-shaped eyes. Sometimes the eyes are more slanted, sometimes they seem to be more horizontal wraparound, there are variations there. Uh, disproportionately long fingers. Most of them had four fingers. Some were reported to have three, others were reported to have five, but they were generally characterized by Four fingers, no opposed thumb, as we use. Two legs, no more. Two arms, no more. Two eyes, no more. And uh, whatever is absolutely the minimum needed for survival, and that's what we see in these beings. It would be ideal to check this composite picture against something else, some kind of tangible proof. One man who may have had such proof was Leonard Stringfield, a UFO researcher who made a special study of UFO crashes and the retrieval of alien bodies. According to UFO researchers, an anonymous source, probably someone inside the federal government, once sent a top secret file to Stringfield, a file containing the complete government report on an autopsy performed on the body of an alien found in the remains of a crashed UFO. Before his death in 1994, Stringfield was videotaped describing the results of the autopsy report he had seen. The dead alien. The head is large, very large by human proportion. Uh, there is no hair, no hair follicles. There, is no, there are no earlobes. There is no nose as we have with human. The mouth is just a slit or an orifice which goes in about uh, approximately an inch. Once again, all the details seem to fit together perfectly. But can we know more about them than just a simple physical description? Why are they here? What do we have that they could possibly want? 
Could it be the government feels we are in imminent danger from these forces? Is there anything we can do about it? Is there any way to know for sure what their purposes might be? The answers will amaze you when UFO Diaries return. The mystery behind visitors from other worlds continues to raise baffling, even terrifying questions. If this is an accurate portrayal of a small gray, then what is it exactly about them that is supposed to be kept secret? While some UFO experts say that it is the U.S. government that has hidden the truth about the small greys, it also seems true that the small greys have hidden the truth about themselves. According to eyewitness accounts, the small greys are silent and have rarely given any indication of the reasons behind their actions. An example is one little boy said to me, you know, um, when he talks to me, he doesn't move his lips. And he said, he can hear everything I'm thinking. Uh, which is, of course, a wonderful way of describing mental telepathy. Perhaps no words are needed for the aliens to tell us all about their purpose here on Earth if we can believe the hundreds of people who claim to have been abducted by these beings. The abduction phenomenon is the most significant aspect of the UFO phenomenon that we have yet uncovered. It is a legitimate phenomenon. People, in my opinion, are being abducted as they describe. If the accounts are true, then all around the world, human beings are routinely taken aboard UFOs against their will and subjected to a procedure very much like a medical examination. Does this tell us what the small greys are really like? It looks as if their scientists interest is in, interested in gathering data and they have no empathy for the uh, emotional trauma they are inflicting upon their victims. Not unlike our scientists uh, taking a chimpanzee out of the wild, putting a tag in there and throwing it back in the troop to see how it re reacts or something like that. Are we being monitored by the small greys the way we observe the habits of lesser creatures on our own world? Or is there more to it than that? Many experts now believe that alien beings want something from us that goes far beyond mere scientific knowledge. But what? What could humankind offer to a race that travels the stars and commands technology far in advance of our own? The current agenda of involvement with humans is one in which we are a resource from which they harvest a number of materials. People have sperm taken, they have eggs taken. Are the aliens collecting genetic material from human beings? And if so, why? I have concluded, and this is a personal view, but I find that a lot of other researchers have reached the same conclusion, that the human race is very likely a hybrid race, and that we probably initially were seeded on this planet, and that I believe we have been genetically manipulated continually from the beginning of our history until today, and the process is still going on. Could it be that the purpose of alien involvement with Earth is purely genetic? Is it possible that the human race is simply being harvested for some unknown alien purpose? The astonishing and frightening answers when UFO Diaries returns. In our quest for the true purpose of alien entities traveling to our world, we have encountered witnesses who claim to have been taken aboard UFOs against their will and forced to be part of an attempt to create a new race of half-human and half-alien beings. But can this incredible-sounding story really be true? Uh, well, now, these things are not as off the wall sometimes as you think. Uh, we feel that the production of these offspring, of the hybrids, is one of the major purposes of the abduction phenomenon, but we don't know exactly why yet. But there definitely seems to be a situation in which uh, this hybridization program, or whatever one wants to call it, has moved into the production of certain people who look very, very human. Now, it's also highly possible that if the aliens can remove a fertilized ovum from a woman, an embryo, and bring it to term in their world that is, let's say, a hybrid, they could perhaps do that with 100% uh, embryos, <coughs> human embryos, 100% humans bring them to term and then raise that 100% human child in the alien environment. And if that person then is part of the alien uh, operation, shall we call it, uh, uh, there would be no way to tell the difference. 
And former intelligence officer Robert Dean claims that during his tour of duty, he saw evidence that the armed forces knew of four alien races actively visiting the Earth. And one appeared to be exactly like us. All of the four different groups were humanoid, but only one of them was completely human. And I, I found it kind of amusing because that seemed to be the subject that bothered the generals and the admirals the most. The idea that one of these advanced intelligences could sit next to you in a plane or a restaurant or in a theater, and you'd never know. But what about the other alien types some witnesses describe? Do they play a part in the agenda of the small greys? There's a small percentage of cases in which people don't see just grey aliens. They see beings that appear to be more reptilian or more insect-like uh, in their appearance. The problem here is that the reptilian ones and the insect-like ones are always seen in company of the great beings. So if they are seeing other beings, they're all working together for the same purpose. So we don't quite know what to make of this uh, small group of, uh, of other beings that people report. But is this the only possible explanation? Have we learned that humankind is little more than a laboratory animal for the use of extraterrestrial invaders? Isn't it possible that the aliens are here for some friendly purpose? There is not an iota of evidence that they're here to help or that they're here to hurt. We don't see them as coming here to, to do bad things to us, to uh, kill us, to eat us, to take over our automobile dealerships and whatnot. We see it as being primarily clinical. But the current agenda, as far as I'm concerned, is one of harvesting resources from us. Uh, much as we would harvest a crop or from a herd of cattle or from whatever, that we are a very useful product. There are physical materials they take from us, and there is emotional and energetic materials that they take from us. And I haven't seen that they've given a whole lot back in, in trade for this. I think it's a one-way relationship. We're dealing with something that at this point seems incomprehensible to the human mind. It's easy to say anything that camouflages and uses deceit must automatically be terrible. That's the easy conclusion. But if we turn away from it, we can be turning away from perhaps the single most important event that is going to come in the next few years. We're right now in information overload. Right now we know tremendous amounts about this subject and we are closing in on the ultimate purposes. And I think within the next few years we are going to completely solve this phenomenon and we are going to know what the entire UFO phenomenon is all about. No matter how you accept this and how you deal with this reality and incredible things that we're going to be confronting in the next few years, we must not be afraid. We've got to understand that we as human beings have an undeniable integrity of our own as a race and as a species. And that, I think, will bring us together. There seems to be a consensus among eyewitnesses of what aliens look like. And government documents do appear to confirm that the UFO phenomenon is being monitored by some high-level group. But will we ever learn the real truth about beings from other worlds? It may well be that for the moment, the decision is still in the hands of a small circle of people in a top secret government office, or in the hands of the extraterrestrials themselves. But in any case, for the time being, the real truth is locked away in a sealed chapter of the UFO Diaries.